This is the freestyle way. Dude, I love it. Well, uh, anyways, I'm glad glad to have you here, and I'm glad to be talking to you. Yes. Uh, I've known you now personally since April, and mm. uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you, learning from you, mm. and uh, just watching you do your thing. And uh, for those who don't know about you that are uh, listeners on my end, uh, Gravity, uh, Miguel yes, Rosario is uh, a b-boy a breaker Mm -hmm. and uh an athlete and uh has uh, a lot to share when it comes to physical expression and uh yeah you're on the pursuit to go into the olympics Um, which is insane it's insane okay so my first question simple why breaking i would i mean you were a gymnast but why breaking it's really crazy you asked that because uh Recently, I had to ask, re-ask myself that again um, because I have so many ambitions and I keep finding myself like I cannot stop doing this. And I'm like, what is it? Why breaking? Um, why this? You know, and uh, I always come to the same conclusion is that it's the only thing where no matter if I'm judged or not judged, I feel like I'm the man. It makes me feel um, my best. It makes me feel my most confident. It makes me feel uh, accomplishing. It makes me feel, even when I first started and I was like trash, you know, like beginner, like I don't even wanna say trash, right? But I want, like when I was very beginner basic, for some reason, I still felt like I belonged. I felt I felt like this made total sense. I'm so sorry, Carl. Party foul number one? Yeah, <laughs> I and I don't even know where my phone is, but it's hooked up to my laptop, so it should just... Uh, but yeah, man, it just felt like... Dude, it just felt like I really belong. So I, I just can't stop doing it, man. I don't think I will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've known of you for a long time, several years. And and one of the reasons I knew about you was because you are well known for doing a double back. Yes. Double backflip on hard floor, which is something that you don't don't see. I mean, especially gymnasts are like, yeah, no, screw that. I need I need a mat. But you you you, you didn't just do it on hard floor, but you did it in competition. It, is is that something that you feel like uh set you onto this like trajectory that allowed you to stand out or was that just like one little blip in the craft of breaking when you when you kind of came into the scene so do you ever um do you ever see like in movies how they have like on with the stock market exchange and people are like oh oh this that, this, that. um <laughs> Uh, I felt like that's what it was when I first started breaking. Like, oh, I'm right here. You know, like that's what it looked like. And I didn't, I didn't, I'm not that type of person. Like, I don't feel like, I came from gymnastics. When I walked in the room, it was like, oh man, BGC is here. Like, oh snap, the Brooklyn kids are here. Like literally. And I've, and then when I went to school, same thing. Like I, it was like, I always had that um, energy. And when I saw it was like that in breaking, I would always think to myself, like, first of all, even before I started breaking, uh, backstory, I got kicked out of the gym when I was younger because I was like defiant. And uh, my coach wanted me to like, you know, take my steps. And I was always like, just, and my dad worked at the gym, ran the gym. So I had no boundaries. I wasn't listening to anybody. And one day my coach was like, hey, you're suspended for the summer. And that hurt because you know that's off season you know and off season is important because that's that's when you come back with the new moves and so uh when i was younger my dad would tell me about street tumbling and how he had his own crew and da 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 and so i took to the streets and i started tumbling there and i would go to coney island and i would meet like tata before tata was Tata, before he was that, he was a kid that was just a little boy that was just traveling on the trains, hitting in the street. And 
uh, before I was breaking and he he was a b-boy like he was a hitter we were just flipping in the sand and flipping off things I used to flip off of like uh, the playgrounds I'm talking about 15 feet in the air doing a backflip and then landing and rolling out like I was trying to find playgrounds that were high and I would just flip off and I would land on that rubber blacktop and so I always would like push the limits like I always push the limits and when I went into breaking um, nobody was flipping. Maybe like a cheat gainer, like that was it. Maybe a round off tuck. That was like the max back then. Nobody was twisting. Nobody, at least not in New York. Actually, nobody in the East Coast. The only person in the United States that I ever seen flip was Speedy from, uh, well, he lives in Vegas now, but Unique Styles. And, and so... Um, you know, I just thought to myself, like, moves are superpowers. This is what I've learned in breaking. If you have uh, a dope move, my family's about to come in right now, just a heads up. But uh, if you have a dope move, that is your power. That is your strength. And so I thought to myself, like, man, seriously, like, I can, I was busting double backs when I was like, I think I did my first double at like eight you know, and landed it on the spring floor before I was 10, you know, probably by nine, you know. Um, and so I was doing it for a very long time. And I just thought to myself, we were at a practice spot, 17th Street. And, you know, we had just panel mats. And I was like, I'm going to try it. And I was setting timers, like just rolling out of it, just rolling out of it. And then finally, I was like, I'm just going to do it. And when I hit it, everybody went crazy. Like nobody knew what I was going for. Because I was just doing a really high tuck, round the round the back handspring, bah! and nobody knew until I did it, and the whole gymnasium went nuts. Like I wonder who was all there and still remembers that day, you know. Um, and so the first time I actually did it, I thought first of all I got a lot of love for it. Or in gymnastics, you're not getting any love for a double backflip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, <laughs> it like is basics. Yes, bro. Even like even I used to compete full ins, like full in back out, and I would stick them. And you don't get a lot of love for it, dude. It's not a double double, you know. Like it's just it's a single double, you know. Like, right. And, and so uh, when I saw how people would go nuts for it, I was like, oh man, their their mentality on like flips is primitive, straight up. This is like my mentality, you know. And so I'm like, this is my superpower. Um, first time I did it was in Times Square. We were battling the hitters, and mind you, now I'm a b boy and I'm out there and I haven't done it yet, but I have it in my belt. But it was only it was always done on wood floor on a panel mat. Okay, so mm. we all know panel mats are inch thick max. Um, but and, enough that's enough cushion to give you like that, that to absorb to absorb yeah. the impact. Yeah, yeah, your so, ankles, the whole body, just yes. the shock is insane. Yes, and so uh, when I started street tumbling, though, I had to change up my my tumbling style. You know, that's, mm -hmm. it, it had to change. You know, yeah, so, it anyway. looks like Chinese acrobatics when you do it. Yes, because like. my snap is really powerful. My snap is massive. It starts from the elbows out, and I just, oof, which is not gymnastics form. Like, it's very different. Anyway, um, yeah, you're very, you're very archy in the back handspring, and it's short, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's insane. Yeah, and so, uh, so I did it against the hitters, and the way I did it was like. I went, they went, I went, and they just kept matching me on these combos and these flips. And I was like, dude, like, I don't have anything else left. Straight up. Mm -hmm. They were like, round off, whip, whip, whip full. Like, these are hitters, dude. Like, just dudes in this tub subway on concrete. And my dad told me about, like, this, like, um, underground world, people that know how to flip. He used to be in a tumbling, street tumbling crew. It was a real thing. So I felt like that's what I was in. I see. Mm. I wonder and, if that's like the origin of tricking, but anyways, that's interesting. And so the crowd was hundreds of people, Times Square, um, on a 6 p.m. like weekday. All right. So well, it's ridiculous there. Uh, and sure enough, I go for it. I'm just like, everybody gives me my space, and I just, whoom, and I just, I remember hitting it and my head kind of jolting back from the landing. Like I hit, I, I never felt so much impact, but I remember I hit and 
you know, when you hit, you can, you kind of sink in. But when I hit, it was like, boom, my head jolted back and I like landed and I realized I landed on my feet. And before I can even stand up, the crowd picked me up like a wave, like not even breakers, like regular people were like screaming. They understood that this guy just did a double backflip on concrete and it was they understood the conversation between i'm better than you no i'm better than you and i remember like being taken almost to my train like people just patting me on the back yelling like taking photos with me i'll never forget that day and that was the day that i remember i showed up to a jam like that weekend which is the dollar jam and everybody was talking like everybody was looking at me now it's different now I'm no longer like, ah, oh, it was, um, it was like different now, right? Like now it was like, oh, yo, that's the kid with the double backflip. Like, yo, that's the kid that literally, and then that allowed my style to project and that allowed my style to shine because they were waiting for the double backflip. So because they were waiting for the double backflip, they're just looking at me waiting for it. Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Uh, it just allowed me to break and people see me. So then that's what my style, I feel like, you know, they had no choice but to see my style because they were like waiting for the double backflip, you know? Um, but, you know, my, my I was never like appreciate, like my style was never liked. Um, you know, I was like wild, uh, you know, no form, crashy, rushy, like it had no technique. Everything was just kind of go. But I owned it as if it was the hottest thing, you know. And so, although, yes, the double backflip was like, a, it was the totem, you know. It was like, is he going to do it or not? In the meantime, let's see what he does, you know. And then mm -hmm. if I did it, people would go crazy. I remember seeing videos of people, like, shaking other people because I did it. Like, it was the most insane thing they ever saw, Carl. Yeah. It's insane. It's insane. It's insane. I mean, when even even Which from is me seeing it, it's it's amazing. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's one thousand. So so you you come in hot and you're you're kind of known as the double backflip kid. The double gymnast. backflip. Yeah, the gymnast. How, how long did that last? What was the experience like trying to navigate uh, people putting you in a box and you trying to create your own style yet belong and compete? Like what what was that experience like? It was painful, dude. It was painful. There was not, I had so many, at this point, at this point in my life, I had more conversations with myself than anything in the world. <laughs> um, because I was going through it. I was like, these people, like, I don't even go in there mad or angry. I started going in there angry. Um, but I used to go in there and just bug out and people used to make fun of me. Uh, they used to laugh at me. They used to call, go like this and say, like, you're a gymnast. Get out of here. That's whack. Like, I didn't understand the lingo. I didn't understand that it wasn't real. Like, I didn't understand because the world that I came from was like, God, I fought every single day uh, my senior year of high school. Like, fist fought every single day. Junior high school, I remember um, every day after summer school, I was like, I had to make sure I never left alone because I'd get jumped. I was like a leader of a, of a really big crew and we, we would fight and it would be like massive and you couldn't look at me wrong. We couldn't look at each other wrong. It just went there. And so I come into this world where I don't want to do that. I actually want to leave that life behind, which is actually why I started breaking. Like I dropped out of school because I didn't want to fight anymore. I wanted to just go to practice. Like I just fell in love with this thing and it made me happy and I didn't know how to be mad anymore. And so people were just talking crap to me and yelling at me and like in the battle while I'm breaking, oh, Gaddy, you suck, da, 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 slapping the floor. It was like, it was so stimulating that I would cry sometimes when I left. Like I didn't understand. Um, and I would get mad and I'd be like, I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him. And I started working footwork and top rock. I would go to abandon. Uh, it was an abandoned mall in Brooklyn, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. This dude named Merlin from a crew called Foot Clan. Uh, and Merlin was in a gang, you know, and he was a B-boy, but he was in a gang. And it was like, 
It was like, and he was like, yo, I'll show, I'll, yo, be at this place at this time. And he showed up with a boom box and was like, just bring batteries. And I had to show up with D batteries. And he brought the boom box and he was teaching me basic top rock steps, you know? And I just, because I wanted to be accepted so bad, it sucked that like I wasn't being accepted. And, and then I wanted to lose the identity of a gymnast. I wanted to, I, I so bad. I wanted to lose the identity of a gymnast that I, like, if you, it got, I started fighting at jams, Carl. Like I literally, there is like, like I would, somebody would mess with me in a battle or they would mess me up in a battle. And I would just, I got, I got fed up and I didn't know how to um, anchor my emotions. And I also didn't understand that none of these dudes truly were confident in themselves. And that is why they did those gestures. I didn't know that. And the reason when I did learn that is when I started traveling overseas and these monstrous B-boys would say nothing. They would just like roll their eyes if I started breaking it. If they didn't like something, they'd be like, like, you know, like, and then they would go and then they'd be unstoppable. And, th and these were the guys that were winning, you know, and they would look at me like if I try to bring that same energy to them, like, ah, oh, what's the, like, so rah, rah, they would like, like this. Like in Europe and France, they had so much composure because they were in it for so long already. They were good. Like I started traveling at three years of breaking. I was traveling the world already. You know, so you so were nineteen started, or so. Yeah, I was on probation. Couldn't leave the country. Couldn't even leave the state without permission. Um, and I got on the plane. I got flown out to to. France for the first time starting 2006 is 2009 I'm at the biggest event in the world you know and I try to bring that same energy and these guys that were like massive um something about it though they liked it they like almost thought it was cute if I could like be funny like a puppy trying to bite your freaking <laughs> ankles like I swear that's how because when I see them now the way they treat me is like like, I remember you when you were so young in this and you were just so crazy and you've grown so much. Like, that's the conversations we have. Um, wow. And so, it, yeah, dude, it's li like literally when I see these guys, they like put their arm over me like I'm a little kid. I'm 33 with five kids, got more kids than everybody. <laughs> and they still treat me like this little like nephew um, that's all grown up now. And I think it's crazy, man, because I really wanted to lose that identity. And I had so much anger because I was surrounded by a bunch of um, insecure, dope people. Like they didn't have any security in themselves, you know, and they wanted other people to feel like they were superior. So they just verbally attacked people and abused them. And, uh, you know, it's unnecessary, you know, and I, but in certain situations of breaking, of course, you know, it's a thing, you know, it's like. It's a part of it. Slap the floor. It, it is a mental game. But at that time, I didn't understand that. I thought it was just I wasn't accepted. At that time, I thought it was because um, I, they didn't want me there. That gymnast mm. weren't welcome. And I feel like a mm. part of it was, you know, somewhere inside. Like, this, who is this guy coming over and taking all the attention? He's not even about this culture or this dance. And I wasn't about the culture. I was just about the dance. I didn't listen to hip-hop music. Wasn't even allowed to listen to hip hop music because it was like had mad curse words in it. Like, like my like my wife knows more about hip hop music than me. She's like, you don't know who this person is. That's I'm like, I didn't listen to hip hop when I was younger. I I listened to salsa, merengue, freestyle, you know, pop, whatever was on the radio. Like I I didn't grow up in that, and I didn't fall in love with the culture until I was like an adult. You know, because I didn't mm. know the music. So how can I how can I love something that I know nothing about? You know, so it took me years to even learn about this culture, you know. But it, it was when I started going to, like, events overseas that I learned more about the culture. Because they mm. were, like, how, how so? Because they're enthusiasts over there. Out here, we're in it. I'm listening to my music. I'm playing my music. And they're, they're embracing it. They're sharing it. Have you heard this? Did you hear this? Yo, check this out. And they would dress real hip hop and they would like paint hip hop heads and paint artists and go to Europe. And if you're from New wearing Yankee fitteds and Tim's because they want to look like Jay-Z and you go to clubs in Europe and they're playing, there's a hip hop club. There's an R&B club. 
there's a house club and they and people that are in these different clubs are dressed according to that genre it's dope it's mm -hmm. dope so like when you travel overseas you these people like almost push it in your face not just the music but the history behind it and and then you go back home and then you ask questions and like oh yeah wu-tang yeah look yo check this out and it's like that's how i learned was more because i was traveling overseas than doing it at home mm -hmm. and was the idea always to like when you got into breaking of course you you already enjoyed the acrobatic side, the physical side. But once you got in and you you started kind of competing and battling, did it became like a one track mind of I got to win? I want to smoke everybody. Yeah, I wanted to be the best when I first started. I was like, all right, I got their attention now. Um, I thought it was really cool that like people were idolized in this and I wanted to be idolized, you know, like there was this dude named Devious and he was from a crew called X Fiends and everybody knew who he was. And he didn't know who everybody was, you know, everybody knew who he was. There was another dude called Com3 from Breaks Crew and they called him King Com3, the king of one-on-ones. And I was like, I want that. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the king of New York. Like, and they recognize him as like the king of New York. They recognize this dude as that. Like they had a crew called New York Kings and it was the best guys in New York. I wanted to be on that crew. You know, I wanted to beat those guys. I wanted to be in that crew, which is a super crew. It was like a, everybody had their own crews, but it was a conglomerate. One, the best guy from every crew was in that. Um, and I wanted that. So I, I took to the fact that I didn't know footwork. I didn't know freezes or power or poses or presentation. And I started doing these things, but I just did them so fast and all crazy. And, you know, it was like, this guy has no finesse. And that was a thing back then. And, um, you know, and everybody was like, you need to slow down. Like I started getting to the point where I started traveling. I was representing New York and then more people started coming to New York. And, you know, whenever people would come to New York, the guys would be like, Hey, go battle them. And you came to a practice spot. You, you were, if you're if you were from a different country or a different state and you came to our practice spot, your whole practice was battling me. Because I was told by the older guys to go do it. And I did whatever they told me to do because I wanted them to accept me. Mm. You know? Yeah. And so just, you know, long story short, dude. I I was a part of the New York Kings. I beat Com Three. I beat Devious. And I beat every single dude in New York that had a name that was considered the man. And I, de I devoured them, you know, like now I am the king of New York, you know, like that's literally, uh, literally I own that title, you know? Mm, yeah, that's awesome. Tell me before the Olympics came into the scene, what was the goal? Was it Red Bull BC one? Was yeah. it freestyle sessions? Like what, what was the goal to kind of demonstrate that you dominate? What is it? Was it winning some of the biggest events around the world? Yeah. So it was just, it was like not losing was the goal. You know, it used to be getting past prelims. Then it was like getting the top 16, passing top 16, top eight, top four, top two. Then it got to the point where it was like, I don't want, when I go in, I don't want to lose at all. Like I, I'm, I don't want, even see that as a thing. And if I lost, I would take it hard. I would go to practice either that night or the very next day. Um, and the goal was to, yes, go to the biggest events, which were freestyle session is the Olympics of breaking, you know, like BC one is the, you know, Super Bowl. you know, like that's how it felt like these events were the thing. Um, and so I wanted to go all over the world and just win all the events I could. But I always, like, I loved, I loved playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Mm. Loved it. I wanted to be that for breaking. I wanted to create the, like, breaking video game where it was like Grand Theft Auto, but it was breaking. Makes sense. Makes sense. You know, like, yeah, so you I, I wanted to be wanted Tony to Hawk transcend. Guy. Yeah, transcend just competing and make it something that, uh, yeah, got into the homes of people and, and people could 
you know, compete and breaking mm-hmm. without breaking. They just yes. threw a video yeah. game, right? Yeah, it had nothing to do with the Olympics, but I, but I knew that like in order for me like to be like the Tony Hawk of pro uh, of breaking, like it had to have a professional level, and I knew that I can be a professional breaker before a professional breaker was a thing. I knew that mm-hmm. thing. Like I wanted to have sponsors, and I wanted to. Because we had sponsors, like little ones, like um, Tribal or like Panic 39, like these clothing companies would give us clothing. And that's how we felt sponsored because these brands would give us clothes, um, which was insanely dope to us at that time. And so I thought to myself, what if I can get these companies like to pay me, like pay me to go and compete in your clothes or if I win, match match the prize because i'll be rocking it in your gear and this is before Mm -hmm. audiences were big this is before youtube was even big you know so like it was just a it was a weird thing man but you know i always saw it as something that can be super professional i i lived it you know everybody was giving Mm -hmm. me their clothes you know i I thought oh man i can do this Mm -hmm. You know, and how, so, how did you pay your how did you pay your way to go to these these battles even if it was in the country you had to travel yeah um, yeah where did the money come from how did you make that happen did you have jobs or no uh I used to hit I used to hit I would uh go and remember I met I knew Tata and uh I knew Tata when I was younger and when i got older i would like i would still see tata and so we had like some history and he would teach me how to hit and he showed me what i needed to do and then i would find my areas and go with my crew and we would go and we would hit and we would make some money um and we'd like put on these performances and then we'd all split it and that was enough money to go to like philly for the chinatown bus or to boston with chinatown bus and then i would like when i was there I would ask somebody like, you know, the promoter would know anybody if I could like stay at their crib and sleep on their couch. And people were like, yeah, no doubt. Like I always had a place to stay always, but I would be out first thing in the morning next day, you know, like, cause they had to go to work or something like that. Or, you know, and, and, um, also too, like when I started traveling, I would travel with these guys from dynamic rockers, which is like a legendary crew. And, you know, they kind of showed me the ropes on, they did show me the ropes on that too. I would like, they're like, where's my boy Gravity? Can he stay with you tonight? Or, hey, we're traveling out here. Can we stay with you? And, yeah, people would be cool with it. They'd be like, all right, cool, you know? And it's how it's how we built relationships in uh, breaking was through tr- sleeping on people's couches and um, just kind of, like, mobbing it. You know, everybody, the whole crew would pull up. We all sleep in the living room, like, on somebody's floor. And, you know, it was just like that's how we met people and that's how we built relationships to where I see them today. And I'm like, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? Da, da, da. That's amazing. And do you remember when you first uh, were approached by a brand or anybody who had, you know, some merch or whatever and said, yo, uh, we want to we want to support you or will you rock our stuff? And yeah, yeah, what was that like? And how did you know how to uh, manage that? I didn't know how. I just said yes. I didn't know how. I just said yes. I was like, yeah, man, I'll rock your gear. Like, yeah, like, you know, like, yeah, why not? You know, um. It felt crazy, man. It felt good because they would go up to you like at a competition, at a jam, and they would stop you. They'd have yo come yo come check out my booth, man. Like yo, you're killing it out there. Come check out my booth, and you and I'd go check out their booth, and they'd be like yo, here, man, throw this, 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 you know. And it'd be like yo, man, like I would love to work with you, and I'd be like all right, cool. And then like we'd do a photo shoot or a video shoot, and it, I wouldn't get paid nothing. I wasn't even thinking about money. It was like, yo, I'm going to get sponsored. Like, you know, I wasn't even thinking about money. Uh, I didn't have to because, like, I was out there just everything was being present and in the moment. And so after the jam, the next day, it was gone. The moment was gone. And I would just practice and practice and practice and practice as much as I could because I knew that it would make the next moment come back so much faster. And then what Mm -hmm. can I do in that moment? Um, at the events that's literally where it was for me it was like it had nothing to do with making money like at a high level I didn't understand that I I I didn't understand that till I was like an adult you know and 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 where I had actual agreements in front of my face where I didn't know how to read these things and I didn't understand why these words had so many syllables and I didn't understand why these (laughs) 
Like, you know, like, oh man, you know? So before that though, I was just saying yes to things and, and uh, nobody, it was more about loyalty than it was about agreements and signing. You know, it was really more about loyalty. Like, oh, hey, um, I'm rocking entree. You know, like, ah, sorry, I appreciate it. You know, it started doing that. It started being mm-hmm. like, you know, a thing where it was like, I'm going to just rock with this one brand. Um, and then to the point where like, you know, hey, they stopped giving clothes. And as a as an, as a business owner myself, I understand why they stopped giving clothes. They, they weren't making sales. They couldn't just give up the merch. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot to make. So I understood, you know, and. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I, to me, I was a sponsored breaker at a young age, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you, you, you bring all this up is, 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 but one thing that's kind of resonating with me is this idea of loyalty. I, and I, I am kind of outside looking into the breaking space, but I've been, you know, inside to kind of experience some, some of the interactions and, and this idea of loyalty is very big uh, to the point where it's, it's almost it becomes something that is limiting uh, growth in many ways. It it puts you in a position of intimidation and fear at times, and uh, it's almost like you don't have the freedom to fully express yourself. And something that I've noticed about you, and and I don't know if this is true, but I think you're a disruptor. You you've di- you disrupted the space, and I'm wondering. Uh, what has been the, first of all, if you agree with being a disruptor in a positive way, but, uh, what, what, what has been the, uh, challenges that have come with that? Like the hardships that have come with that and what have been the upsides and, and the positives, uh, you can start with Mm. either. Okay. So when you say I'm a disruptor, I, I actually, uh, I actually understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, I am. Because nobody has ever handed me anything in this game, like because nobody has ever just fully accepted me, like every dub, every travel, when people weren't flying me out, I would still um, find a way to get there. You know, I would do bar mitzvahs and birthday parties and, you know, teach gymnastics with my dad just to just to get to these events, fly myself to Europe, like. You know, like I didn't care. I was going and I would fly myself there and then I would win everything. And because of that, I never fell into the politics. The politics never got me to where I am. So if you don't work with me, I don't really care because I'm going to show up. If I want to go to this event, I'm going to go. I don't need most, most breakers at my level. If they don't get flown out, they won't go. That's a real thing in breaking. They don't usually like invest in themselves. People usually help them get there. That was never me. I would just go. And so I never cared about the politics. So if you did something I didn't like, I would just say it. Most people would stay quiet. Oh, I don't want to burn that bridge. That's this person. They throw this event. Da, da, da. No, hell no. You can be a jerk and, and or an asshole and have a really amazing event. I'm still going to go to your event. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the vibe and the people and the moment that I can capture there. Uh, and so, you know, in breaking, I'm a wild card. You know, it's a gravity's dope. You know what I'm saying? But it's got to, you know, you got to be careful, you know. And, and I know that it's because uh, a lot of people do like me for it. You know, I'm just really straightforward. Uh, if I like something, I like it. If I don't, I don't. If I go to your event and there is something wrong with it and you're a prestigious event, I'm going to, I'm going to say something. I'm going to put you on blast about it because there's things that need to change because I care more about my community than, um, the events that are in the community. Uh, because I want to see it change. I want to see it grow. There's a lot happening. And I've always been like that. I have always been like that. Uh, you know, one year freestyle session, they had, uh, (laughs) They had a huge event, obviously freestyle sessions big, and it was at a casino in the middle of God knows where. It took me two hours to drive there from San Diego. How do you have a worldwide event, like a world-class wide event from people all over the world, and then you have your event two hours away from any near airport, any, Mm. any means of transportation? I'm fortunate. I have 
a car <laughs> and I live in the United States. Um, and I only live like, you know, I live in Arizona. It's a sister state right across. So it's easier for me, but I thought that was whack. And then you get there and you charge, you know, $80 at the door and your, your competition floor is a rolled out linoleum with clear duct tape on top of carpet. That's a problem. We need to change that because you have jumbotrons and all this production and this, that, and a third. But what you want us to break on is is crap. So I said something, and you know, and, and you know what? They called me, Cross and and Polo and all these dudes. They called me and they were like, "Dude, like," and I was like, "Hey, man, just do better." I'm, I, you would you put people on blast, like you know, you just don't expect it's gonna be you. I'm always the guy that's. I'm not afraid to stand up to the titan. Uh, I'm not afraid to stand up to the to the whales, you know. I'm, I'm just not. Um, and so, you know, I, and I do it always in a positive way. I try to do it in a constructive way, you know. But I've always been a very vocal person, and it's not always the best, you know. Even my coach, uh, you know, uh, Flo, he tells me, "Grab, man, you can't, you can't do these things." And I'm like, "Hey, man, look. At the end of the day, uh, I think that I'm a great asset to work with. I think that." Um, I'm going to come in and I'm going to win. I think I'm going to come in. And if I don't win, they're all going to talk about me anyway, because some type of moment is going to happen where it's going to be amazing. I know this about myself, but I will not stand for no bull crap. I will not stand for it. I will, I will speak up and, um, I don't, I don't need, uh, anyone you know i'm an entrepreneur uh, I'm, I'm, i make my own finances i have my family i support them you know i have a amazing wife we work very hard together um and so i continue and i know that my success has nothing my final success like my end goal um entails me doing all the work anyway and so when it i've learned over the years that these are not sponsorships these are monster energy is an amazing relationship is a partnership. I've realized my value and not a lot of people understand that they are valuable. I know that in the, in the sport of breaking and the art form and in the culture of breaking, I'm an asset. Um, if I say that this brand is bad, my community is going to believe me. You know, if I say that, you know, this is wrong. My community is going to stand behind me. If I say this is dope, my community is going to, because they know I've built that honest reputation with my community. And, mm -hmm. um, that is a rare thing in breaking. There's a lot of fake handshakes. There's a lot of like, Oh, Hey, I didn't see you. Hey. And I'm like, I've been right here for five minutes, bro. Like, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, uh, known to call that out. Uh, and I'm not as vocal as before, only because at the end of the day, I keep my head down and I keep working and I have these different ambitions and goals. But I think I've built that reputation um, in the community where I'm just honest and I'm very straightforward. And um, it's because I'm passionate. And so uh, when I disrupt certain, spa uh, disrupt certain spaces, um, I think that it's, I believe it's always in the best, like always in the best. And I just don't stand for people like taking advantage of my community who I know is just a community of passionate artists and athletes who just want to break. They don't want to be taken advantage of. They don't want um, to be crapped on and they don't, they, they just want to break and they want to do this for the rest of their life. My peers love this. If not just as much, if not more than, you know, like, a lot of my peers, they just, they're just like me. And that's why um, breaking is so beautiful because we can't be mad at each other forever. The one thing we all have in common is that we love this so much. And so most of us wish that we can live off of this. And it doesn't even need to be in a competitive aspect. You know, just as artists and dancers, if I don't have to go to work and I can just practice all day and travel the world, like what? And so I think a lot of people know this. And a lot of companies know this and they see breaking as a, as a naive child and they, uh, as a gullible child and they come in and they swoop up and they do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, they lock people in contracts and 
you know, kind of like cut off certain avenues and um, monster energy has shown me the ropes and has taught me about contracts. They have taught me about how corporations work and they have been very brutally honest with me um, on their request, on their demands, on this relationship. And when I understood that, I realized a lot of these contracts look very similar. And I realized that when Monster said, Monster said, uh, hey, man, we, we want you to understand that this is not a sponsorship. Um, it, you know, to the average person, this sounds like a sponsorship. This is, oh, you're sponsored by Monster, you know, uh, but no, you're, you're in a partnership with us. We believe we can help you and that will help us. Our goal is to sell cans. That's their goal. That's Monster Energy. And they have um, a way they do it. They have guidelines. They have like, you know, uh, you know, just they have more morality too. Like this is how we represent, you know, our product. And this is, and we believe that you're, you're a great representation. You're, you're an amazing athlete, X, Y, and Z. And we need this from you to help us do this. And in return, we will do this for you. Uh, and I, when I was younger, I didn't understand that. And now I realize like how many of us are really looking at it as a, as a partnership. You know, I think a lot of a mm -hmm. lot of us are still looking at it like how I did. I want to be sponsored. I want to, yeah, I'll wear your gear and I'll just do it for free because I'm sponsored. You know, like, um, and so when I realized these things, you know, just you know, as you grow as a human, man, you you and you know, breaking, I love it so much. It's it's done so much for me. How dare I not speak up? You know, like when 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 I felt like I was nobody. And when I felt like life sucked and when I felt like I had nothing and when I felt like I was a lost person and I didn't accept myself because I wanted to be accepted, breaking somehow took me in and saved my life. And it has done so much for me. And so how dare I not be a disruptor in certain situations and scenarios? You know, how dare mm -hmm. I not speak up? for my community, you know, and, and listen, man, it doesn't come with, it doesn't come without, um, you know, some consequences, you know, and, uh, in certain areas, you know, but at the same time, you know, just, I'm okay. Like I'm, I'm so okay with who I am as a person. My conscience is clear. I'm honest. Uh, I'm straightforward. I mean, well, and I work hard. And so mm -hmm. that's not going to fit every brand. You know, that's not going to fit right. every partnership. That's only for a selective, that's for a selective partnership, man. It's, it is. So I've accepted that I am not a general, I am not a general asset. I'm a very mm -hmm. like, ooh, he may not work for us because we can't, I might, he's a little risky, you know, that's okay. Like I, I've, I've come to like accept that, you know, of course there's, of course I have my limits, right? Like I understand professionalism and I won't like, I'm not going to like disvalue or discredit a brand, you know, like I, I, I get it, you know, but at the same time though, I, I will, I will speak up, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's uh, as long as you can sleep at night, that's, that's a good thing in that you're not doing any harm and, and your disruption comes from a place of wanting to uh, better the community, better the scene. And you know, mm -hmm. not, not everybody may, may like it or agree with it, but I think if you take a, uh, a look from above, you can kind of see over time yeah. that there there is a there's a track record that indicates that uh, the your intentions are uh, one of betterment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, it's challenging to to do that because um, yeah, you're in a you're in a scene that is about one upping each other. You know, you go to battle mm -hmm. and it gets it gets heated uh in these battles yeah. and it seems like uh the the most heated battles are when it's not a competition when it's like a cypher type thing or you know somebody calls you out that's i think that's where the real yeah because magic happens mm -hmm. and that's because you know that's where that's where your true hard work is is challenged you know like that's where you go the distance and it's like you really find out like do others work harder than you mm-hmm Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and and something that I appreciate about you is that 
even since April that we've 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 known each other and we've got to know each other and I've 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 got to learn from you is is that you're not somebody who has a fixed mindset. Yes, you have principles, you have values, but you are you are truly willing to take in new information and yes. uh yeah, restructure concepts, the way that you think about things. Like you're a great student. And yeah. I don't know how how uh, much of that is actually appreciated or perceived uh, in the scene from you. But yeah, do, do you consider yourself uh, uh, somebody who's like growth uh, growth driven that way in the way that you experience life and the way that you look at life? Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like every year, every month, every week, every day, every hour, I'm, I'm growing because I'm constantly – you know, like when we first started doing some some calls together, I don't know if anybody else brought it up to you, but I noticed that after like every week you had a different book right there in the corner. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I don't know if anybody else has brought that up, but I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to know what you're reading. I want to know because, you know, you're a person of information and knowledge and I'm like, what you got over there, bud? You know, like, what do you know that I don't? Um, because mm. I do want to, I do love to learn. And you know, my wife makes fun of me sometimes and she's like, you're a know-it-all. And I'm like, I'm not a know-it-all. I just know some things um, because I do love to learn and I do apply. I don't just read or I don't just like watch. I apply, you know, um, I'm a people watcher. Uh, so my mom would tell me like whenever I go visit in New York, she'd be like, hey, take my car, go do your thing. And I'm like, no, I'm going to take the train. And she's like, why? And I said, well, you said the city's changed a lot and uh, I want to go see it. And I, and I'll sit there and I'll people watch. And I've, oh, since I was a kid, I would just look at everybody's facial expressions and I would, I would, um, you know, travel to different areas of the city and I would just watch people look at them. I'd sit at the, at the South street seaport and I would just watch f foreigners come with their families and see how, amazed they were by these ships and the buildings and you know i i i'm a people watcher and i and i learn you know i've watched fathers with their kids i've watched families with their kids i've watched kids with their parents and i just learn um and then when i go to events or if i sit in a room like a business room which like recently i sat in a, a two-day seminar and it was about real estate and I asked more questions than anybody in the room. Um, and then I watched and I watched how people dressed the first day and I watched how they dressed the second day. And I noticed that everybody wanted to make an impression the first day and the second day, uh, everybody was dressed kind of normal. And both days I went in with jeans and a, and a hoodie and some sneakers and a hat and it made, I didn't wear my ring. I didn't wear my jewelry. I, cause you know, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm here to learn, you know? And so I just, um, you know, I, I just watch, you know, um, and I learn and I, and I try to apply, you know, and, and one thing that I've learned, like one of my favorite things, uh, I went to, you know, a buddy of mine and it was like, Hey, I wanted to open up a, a facility in New York. And a buddy mm -hmm. of mine was like, Hey, I know a contractor who is a really successful man. Maybe he would be interested um, in, in partnering with you and giving you some capital. So I go and I meet with this guy in the city. I am in slacks, a button up. I have a, a notepad. Um, I got a haircut. I have a gold ring on, I have a chain on and I go to meet with this guy. I look good. I look good. Snazzy. Um, he shows up jeans chanclas, a t-shirt, and a rubber wedding, like a wedding band. Instantly, the first thing I thought was, fuck. Right? Yeah. And so he sits down with me and he, we talk, we, we, we have food. We don't even talk about business. He's just talking to me about me and I'm talking to him about him. Pretty cool. And then he goes, so let's, uh, let's, let's get into it, man. What do you need? And I was like, well, I want to like raise some capital and, you know, I would like to actually, I didn't even talk like that. I said, I, I need to um, have this much money to do X, Y, and Z. 
He's like, about how much do you have right now? And I was like, well, I have about you know five thousand, but obviously I need like two hundred and fifty thousand. And he was like, mm-hmm. uh, how bad do you really want to do this? And uh, this is two thousand seventeen, so it's not that long ago. He said, how bad do you want to do this? And I'm like, really bad. He goes, it's a nice chain. How much is that? And I was like, oh, it's about like three hundred dollars. He goes, and that ring? Where'd you get that? And I was like, oh man, I actually uh, I won this. It's a championship ring. He goes, how, about, how much is that worth? And I was like, oh, it's about a thousand. He goes, uh, look, man, I I think it's great, man, but I think you gotta decide whether you really want this or not. He goes, you have money. And I'm like looking at him, and um, then I realized, you know, and we said it really nice, and we talked, and he gave me some different ideas on how I can get started. You know, to build build my capital. Why don't you, you know, rent out a space, get X amount of students, so that you do this, this, and this. And then, you know, I was I was coming to him with an idea, um, and I realized in that moment that this millionaire guy, you know, parked his regular Camry in the parking garage, came in chanclas and to a business meeting. Didn't know who I was or anything, so it wasn't like he's like, oh, some kid. No, he was like referred to me by a billionaire guy who, you know, like, and I realized I, you know, I just learned in that moment, you know, in that moment, I learned that materials mean absolutely nothing, you know, uh, has nothing to do with your success. It's your mentality, you know, like, why am I not willing to give up certain things? Clearly, I'm not willing to give up certain things. I don't want it that bad, you know? Um, and you know, that was, that was just like one instance. And another instance was like a dude, um, his name is Brendan. And he told me another very, very successful man. He's like, Hey, who are you? I'm at, I'm at this billionaire's house. He's like, Hey, who are you? And I said, uh, Oh, I'm, I'm one of uh, the breakers that, you know, Steve brought out and no, no, no. Who are you? It's just me and this guy in this big ass house. And he's just like, no, who, who are you? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm Miguel. You know, I'm from. No, no, I'm not. I don't want to know about you. I said. Who, I said, who are you? And then I was like, who are you, Brendan? And then he goes, oh man, I'm just this piece of shit Irish kid from Boston. I ain't shit. You know, I'm nobody. And I was like, thrown off. And then he was like, let me tell you something. I tell my kids every day, you ain't shit and the world owes you nothing. So when somebody asks you who you are, you don't ever forget. You ain't shit. You're just this. And then I said, and he goes, you're just this. And I said, I'm just this punk kid from Brooklyn, New York. And then he was like, and, and I said, I ain't shit. And he goes, and the world don't owe you shit either, so go get yours. And I never forgot that. And I've learned since then that that is humility. Like that is what pure, hum- like to be humble, to never forget that you are that guy that first had the idea to be this guy. You will never mm. ever not be that guy. And you, and because of that, you will always strive to be more. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, these instances is what I, I love when like learning things like that. I can't wait. I, you know, I sat down uh, last time in Miami with, um, a what is he? Eighty six year old um, guy from Russia who lives here now, and I'm like eighty six. This guy looks like he's sixty, and he's like fit. Eighty six years old, Carl. Old man came out the beach and out the water, and you know, I just the first thing I thought was to just ask him or talk to him, and I thought to myself, like, I'm gonna ask this guy some questions. I want to learn something from him, you know, and. Um, you know, I asked him because he moved here. He moved to Miami for his daughter um, years ago. And I asked him, like, you know, if you can give any advice um, to somebody like me, you know, just a young kid or a young guy, like, what what would it be? And he said, uh, it's not that serious. That's what he told me. Nothing is that serious. Mm. Like, it's okay. You know, I just live every day like it's not that serious it's so it's okay like things are gonna be okay like 
everything is temporary and as long as you know that you'll be okay and when he said everything is temporary you know and mind you this guy walked away you know he walked away he disappeared at the beach like and i thought to mm-hmm. myself it's it's not it's not that serious like everything is temporary when he said everything was temporary i thought to myself my success is temporary you know like mm. my 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 skills are temporary you know like it's my family temporary like but what i thought of is it all could be temporary you know it's up to me to to keep these things and in that sense i have to you know the, it, it just started to unlock all these different doors where i feel like i've lived many mul- multiple lives man um you know and so yeah I, I do consider myself a massive sponge uh just somebody who loves information i love information yeah yeah you you do and you you're you're a great you're a great learner dude you've been mentoring me you've been mentoring me since we met you know, and you have, uh, you know, I didn't go to college. I didn't go to school. So I meet people like you and all these uh, amazing people that have other information, more information, different information. And I like, li- I literally listen to you, like, especially you, you know, even my wife would be like, hey, I haven't heard you talk to Carl in a little bit. And I was like, honestly, like uh, right now, babe, I'm just in the moment. I'm here with you guys. And, you know, like, Carl knows this and we chat every so often and she's like, Oh, okay, cool, cool. Like like she knows that mm-hmm. like I I talk to you and you know, your mentorship yeah, yeah. clearly has made an impact because even my wife's like, Hey, like what's going on? You haven't talked to Carl, you know, like I appreciate that. That's so. amazing. Go Bianca. <laughs> Dude, no, but uh, working with you, talking to you, learning from you has been uh, yeah, a pleasure. And uh, I mean, do you remember the first time we talked? Uh, when we got on the phone? I was like, Oh damn, I'm talking to this guy that I've you know, seen online and I had no clue what to expect. And you just showed up like, okay, yeah, tell me what's, what's up. How can, how can, how can I get better? And I was like, Mm -hmm. I'm just a random guy uh, that has been kind of sent to you. Yeah. Via people that you do know that you respect like Wicked Mm -hmm. Flow and Bonita, of course. But um, I was surprised, honestly, because what I was perceiving to be a truth by what I was seeing online. Like if I went on, you know, like some Reddit thread or yeah. some like <laughs> B-boy commentary thing, uh, it just doesn't match who you are. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was just utterly impressed and surprised and excited. And as much as maybe I've shared with you, every time we've talked, I've gotten better. You've made mm. me better. Something that you made sure that I was aware of this year was um, two things you've told me that have made an impact. One is uh, protect your time and your energy. Be more selective. Mm-hmm. Totally true. I, I, I'm naturally somebody who enjoys giving, enjoys supporting, but I, I've killed myself doing that. Like I've literally damaged my body doing that. And you're also... Uh, the one of the few <clears throat> who has asked me genuinely how I'm doing without uh, seeking for something in return. You know, a lot of people say, hey, Carl, how you doing? And if mm-hmm. you tell them how you're doing, then they ask you for the favor. You, you're you not like trying to get anything from me. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. And I, and I told you one day just via message. I don't know if you remember. I said, you know, few people actually do this and you said to me yeah that means that your circle is too big and i was like ah yeah Mm -hmm. tighten up your circle carl and it's something that i needed to hear this year so it's been a a true gift to receive that from you Uh, so thank you and uh i'm i'm 2023 that's how i'm i'm rolling tight circle and uh i'm going to be giving but i'm going to be very selective in in the way that i do that so Thank I want to share. Can I share something with you real fast? So, uh, please. You, you said that it made me like really emotional, um, because like my eyes got super watery when you said that. Because um, I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad that you learned that from me telling you, and you didn't learn it the same way I had to learn it. If that makes mm. any sense, like the way I had to learn that was was like painful, you know. Um, To where, like, you know, I knew people knew I was stressing and they would still, 
uh, request more from me. It was almost like just keep keep plugging because I'm almost there. I don't know what he's got left, but I'm almost there. And I had to learn that um, personally, you know. Um, somebody didn't tell me that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I just realized like, damn, man. You know, I'm I'm like my family, like we're going through it to where my wife didn't even feel like she came first. She felt like she was always on the back burner and it wasn't intentional. It was literally that I was just so giving and so open and um, to where I was blinded and, it, it, you know, it put my family in a position and it was painful, you know, um, and, and I had to make my circle so much tighter. And then I started to be able to breathe more, believe it or not. Um, and I'm and you know, I, I kind of noticed from you, like, just by talking to other people that you were being pulled in other directions, like, you know, you had a lot of different people to manage at one point, just off of pure heart. It, like it was we we were not paying you you were just like hey these are my schedules and then you started opening up your time and then even i realized like i would talk to you when i first started talking to you it was through slots i would go on your on your site and i would be like okay call has this slot available i'm gonna book this slot and then that our relationship kind of grew a bit mm-hmm. and the slot thing i was like hey you got a second and you gave me that time and then mm-hmm. we kind of, I never booked you again. Like I just been, you know, hey, we get on a call. And and then I, you know, would talk to like Jeff. And he's like, yeah, I just got the phone with Carl. And I was like, like, you remember I told you I'm a people watcher. And I, and I, and I, and I pay attention to detail. It's like my thing. And then I started thinking like, and then I, and then I started seeing you post with Vicky. And then I started like, I'm thinking there's a bunch of us on this team. How many doors you know, how many people walked through that door already and now it's just open and I was like, dude, like, and then I know you have your own family going on and you, like, you just are, to me, you know, you're a successful individual, very smart. You have done a lot of things that takes a lot of time. Um, I feel like you've lived a couple of entrepreneurial lifestyles, like lives and not lifestyles, lives. Um, and I just know what it takes to do one uh, entrepreneurial thing. And I just thought to myself, like, holy crap, is he okay? Like, who who talks to the guy that talks to the people that are going through it? And uh, that's when yeah, my had therapist, that <laughs> yeah, you know, which is which is like, you know, <laughs> you know, and then who talks to that person, you know? And so uh, I just, you know, I've built a friendship with you, and that's where that came from. But I'm glad that you know, like, I was able to do that and help in that sense because. Um, you know, I've been in really dark places, man. And it's, and, and I've, and I, I have always pulled myself out and then I get reassurance, you know, um, through like Mm -hmm. people like you and my, my mother, but before the conversation gets to them, I'm in the dark moment with the choices and I've pulled myself out where like, no, like, Mm -hmm. this is not, you don't, you don't gotta be, uh, in this place right now, you know, you have to put, I have had so many com- conversations with myself um, where the, I, where I literally realized gravity and Miguel are two different people. They are literally two different people mm-hmm. and the warfare um, is crazy. You know, uh, it's, it's truly crazy, man. You know, like I'm convinced that nobody knows the real me. Nobody knows the real you. Only you do. Only you know what you truly want to share and what you do not want to share. And the real thoughts you have Mm. versus the thoughts people, the thoughts you actually share. The conversations that are in the back of your head when people are talking to you, like we don't, people don't talk about these things. And I know I can't be the only person that can sit on a three hour flight and have a full conversation with myself the whole time unless I fall asleep. You know, um, yep. and and I realized like, man, like people are mysterious and we have some crazy conversations with ourselves because all scenarios pop up um, and it's up to us to truly like decide right from wrong. That's where information comes in and handy, you know? Yep. Yep. And, you know, this is kind of like the saying, everybody dies alone, which means that not you're, you're never going to express mm. everything that is true to you, to the world. You're always going to have something that is 
uh, whether you're aware of it or not, that is kind of a secret or something that is has not come out. And I think this is where uh, I'm very inspired by breaking, especially uh, the artistic expression of breaking, because the the artistry allows you to express these dark truths, these uh, things that have been just hidden in the deep, 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 you know, corners of your mind and express them in very beautiful ways. Like you drew this feather, I think with maybe a pencil or something. I, I don't know uh, how you did that, but yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that feather, you know, uh, to the whatever, the the mind that is just superficial just sees a feather. But I saw so much more uh, in, in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that the artistry of, of breaking there is so powerful. And I think this is one of the reasons you you live by this motto that the new the, the new athletes are artists. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk to me about that where that comes from and what what you're thinking is about um that that yeah. that motto yeah so as we as we step into this realm of sport um a lot of things started to pop up uh the main thing was longevity and that is what breakers lack they lack the longevity um the breakers go through so many injuries because we're in the moment. We pull up, we do our thing, we bust, da 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 da, and then you know we can get injured real easy. I, a lot of the old school breakers like massive knee surgeries. Like, how do you go through like? Flo told me something like twelve knee surgeries. Like what? Like what? You know, I, other ones, hip yeah, replacements, and this, that, and a third, and that's a lot of trauma. Like. That is a lot of trauma. And so uh, I started thinking like it started bringing me back to gymnastics. And how was I able to train six days a week, four to five hours at a time, and then compete on Sunday? (laughs) How was I Mm. able to do that? It did not have to do with age. It did not have to do with the fact that I was a kid because when I was a teenager, I was still able to do it. The only time I got hurt in gymnastics is when I missed the catch. That was it. You know, I pulled in too hard on high bar and I wrapped up and I boom, or I didn't, I didn't snap down at the bottom of the bar. So when I came up for my flight, I cracked the back like, or when on P bars, like I didn't throw hard enough, you know, like for my double to to go off to the side or my stutz, I over rotate and I fell over, you know, like, there was always an injury based on um, a technical difficulty. Um, mm-hmm. Breakers do not have technical difficulties. We literally wake up destroyed. I was fine at practice. The next day I woke up destroyed. Um, and then I started to realize that if I wanted to keep doing this, I had it to revert back to my training. And gymnastics mm-hmm. was all about the conditioning. I conditioned, I have to condition, I have to stretch and have mobility. I did ballet and gymnastics so that I can focus on my posture. My shoulders don't sit forward. If I'm chilling, it's because I'm actually leaning on my, sho- my, my knees right now. But like my posture when I'm walking around, my shoulders are back. I, my head, I, I have good form. Um, my body is mobile. Um, and so I realized that breaking is an art. And the competition is the sport. And how do we continue to do our artistry and compete in this sport if we're not conditioning? And then, um, you know, these young kids are incredible. They are getting better and they're getting crazier. And the things that they're just showing my wife, it was a 10 year old kid doing 90s, spinning, going into a lotus, coming out, grabbing his foot, still spinning, never lost momentum. I would have. You know, wow. Um, and I and I didn't understand, but what I do understand is that these kids—they're prepping, they're they're working hard, they're getting it, they're working technique. But are they going to last until they're sixteen, seventeen, eighteen? Um, and mm. that's where my fear is. That's where my fear is. Um, and I took on this whole like I I totally brought back how I condition, how I train. So before I practice. 
I am doing a full one hour workout that has to do with strengthening my joints and my tendons, my ligaments. And then I do mobility at the end. Um, some days I don't break. I just do mobility with one hour, two hours of just movement. Um, and this is all to make sure that my body can, can, can sustain. Um, and so as we step into this realm of sport with our artistry, in order for us to continue to do this, we need to be athletes. We need to accept that we are athletes so that we can have sustainability. And so, you know, when I came into breaking, being an athlete, people say, this is, you're not, a, not an athlete. You're, this is artistry. This is not a sport. This is a dance. This is art. And it's like, yes, it is a dance and it is an art form, but in order for us to truly do this or even excel to a level that we can imagine in our head, we have to become athletes. And so we have to be able to accept the two components like gravity and Miguel. There's two very different components, but they, they very much must exist together in order to succeed. Uh, same thing with artistry and athleticism, in order for these two things to succeed, uh, they need to come together and we need to accept that we are both. And so uh, coming into this where the world where breakings on ESPN and they're like, yo, this sport, this sport, people don't even realize that they're actually watching artistry at the finest level. And so that's what I represent, you know, these, I am the athlete artist. And so the new athletes are artists. It's just how I would like to be, um, recognized or identified uh in this as this moves forward into the olympics yeah which is cool you know coming from gymnastics and all uh the sport of gymnastics is actually called artistic gymnastics mm -hmm. and which is, this is kind of s similar yeah one thousand percent uh you know obviously same same but different right uh here's the Here's the difference with gymnastics uh, and any sport, actually, to me, compared to breaking. Everything is linear for me. Uh, everything is lines, and everything is either forward, back, side, side, left, right, up, down. Um, mm -hmm. That's just what it is. In breaking, it is the most unorthodox it is like looking at somebody draw, uh, what was that guy that, uh, he would, he would paint like with a brush and he'd be like, uh, this here is a tree and we're Bob Ross, Ross. Yeah. So Bob, Bob Ross would be gymnastics. This is linear. This is a tree and he would make it look beautiful and it is incredible. And this whole landscape is incredible, but it's all, um, identifiable like you can look at it and you know that that is a tree but then you have Basquiat who comes out and scribbles and draws and throws splatter and you know the lines are all crazy but it's beautiful and if you would frame that and put it in your living room you'd pay five times more for it and that is what breaking is breaking is the unorthodox it's the painting you have to look at and try to interpret versus oh yeah this is a painting of a clock melting you know or now you're like breaking for me is literally almost impossible to understand like that's why it's so subjective that's why it's difficult to put a system on it that's why it's difficult to judge and so that is why i feel like it is very different these athletes that although it's artistic gymnastics it's still it's still very linear for me, you know, uh, now you're just learning the names and it's because me and you compete against each other. Let's just say we're both level one, uh, gymnast and, uh, we're in the same competition. It's going to come down to, you know, who's got the pointer toes, the pointed toes, whose legs are straighter, who's going to stick the landing. It has nothing to do. Me and you are doing the same moves just in a different sequence potentially you know and and do we make it look flawless who looks it who makes it look more effortless you know that's the same thing with like ballet ballet is an artistry 
but it's all about who is like the finest in it. Breaking is more about the uh, element of surprise. You're not surprising anybody in gymnastics. Maybe if instead of doing two twists, you're doing three. That's like, oh, that's crazy. But you're not, you're not blowing anybody's mind anymore or ever um, because you did one extra twist. It's dope. It's crazy. That's very difficult. Um, but in breaking, it is the true sport of the element of surprise. It is a true sport where anything goes and it, you would never expect somebody to do that. I remember the first time I seen somebody throw a backspin in the air. What? Like they look like a flying saucer, you know, like crazy. I, I, I've seen the I've seen the craziest things in breaking that have made me feel like nothing is impossible. Like truly the impossible does not exist in breaking. And so um, that's why I feel like we are like the, the, the new athlete. We are the new athlete. You know, because we're in a sport that is now hitting the stage. And that's why the key word in this is not athlete and artist. It's new. That is the key word in, in that sentence. Um, because the whole world is going to be, has never been truly mind blown. Usain Bolt has broken records. It's interesting that you say this because something that just came up for me now, and I've never really thought about it this way. Um, is that in breaking, you go up against your opponent, but then there's a third party, which is the music. Yeah. And the music actually dictates a moment in many ways. So uh, it's something that you can't recreate. Yeah, no, you right. don't get, not everybody gets the same play, but somebody's going to get a moment. I may get a moment that somebody else is not going to get, and it's up to me to capitalize on that. And if I don't capitalize on it, everyone's like, oh, if I would have had that song, I would have killed it. You know, like you have to capitalize on these moments, and that doesn't always happen, you know? And so we always have different playing fields, man. Like I, I wish I get certain, I would have got certain songs, but somebody else got that song, and I know that my style could have thrived uh, with that song versus the one that I got, you know? So it just really – the DJ has to know his his like who's up, you know. The DJ has to know who's up and and what's gonna be dope for their style. And it's a, it's a lot, man. And sometimes the DJ be like, I wonder what he'll do to this or she'll do to this, you know. And so it, it yeah, there's there are there are three components in this, you know. Um, there used to be four that used to matter if the judges who the judges were. Now it doesn't really matter anymore. It's all about like, you know, it's all about the the one breaker A, breaker B, and the music. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, okay, so the Olympics. Let's get into the Olympics just for a little bit. So the Olympic comes around. Uh, when do you learn that the Olympics is happening? And when do you decide, okay, I'm going to do this thing? Okay, so I learned the Olympics is coming a few years ago. Um, it was like a talk. It was a conversation maybe like right before 2020, maybe 2019, 2018. It was like a conversation. No, like, like 2019, right before COVID. Um, it was a conversation, and I was, and I knew instantly it's going to happen. It's going to happen, and the reason why I thought it was going to happen is because I thought to myself, "Who watches the Olympics anymore?" Straight up, like I, I don't even, I, I only watch gymnastics, and it's because I'm a gymnast. Mm -hmm. There's so many sports in it, I, I just don't watch it anymore. And if you look at uh, footage from the Olympics back in the day to now, the stadiums were packed some events like battle of the year we get more attendance than the olympics does at these events you know like at the actual like sport um and then i mm -hmm. i noticed that breaking is in every cartoon it's in every movie it's in every meme it's in every game fortnite you name it like it's in everything and i thought to myself if the breaking doesn't it it I said, but I also said that they only want to put breaking in it because they need new faces. And sure enough, that was the conversation was they need young, they need a younger audience. The Olympics needs a younger audience. And I almost felt like breaking was like a pity addition. Uh, oh, it wasn't no. that they re yeah, this is how I felt, you know, like I felt like, and so, you know, me, I'm going to speak up and I'm going to say how I feel. Uh, I thought to myself like, damn. 
It's not because they respect the sport of breaking. It's because if you type in breakdancing, the videos have millions of views. I have six to tens of millions of views on my battles. And I'm not at that, at those times, I wasn't even the biggest battle. Some of these battles have like views, life-changing views, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I thought to myself, man, they're just going to freaking use us to get new, a uh, new audience on their, on their platform. And I still feel that way. I still feel that they do like, we are not respected as athletes at all, at all. And, and, and we can get into that, but it, like, I just know this, you know, and, um, I know that breaking is the asset. I know that without breaking, nobody's going to watch. Look at the events. The the events that they've had that were like on Olympic platforms, they have had the most attendance. This is the new thing, you know? And so anyway, so uh, when I found out about it, I knew it was going to be the thing. And I told my mom, I was like, Castro, I call my mom Castro. I don't even call her mom. Uh, I call her okay. mom when we're like in like a, uh, a sentimental moment. Like, mom, I love you. All right. You know? But mm -hmm. most times it's like, yo, Castro. So. I was like, hey, Castro, like, Reagan's going to the Olympics. And she's like, what? No. And I said, dude, I sent her the article. I sent her, like, the conversations, like, that were on the news. And, and she was like, holy shit, no way. And I'm like, dude, she's like, you're going to go. And I said, I'm going to go. This is when we started talking, like, I'm going to I'm gonna do this thing. You know, I'm going to, this is going to, like, what are the chances that, uh, I leave gymnastics to pretend like when I could have potentially been in 2012 Olympics uh, to prepare for something like that. I leave it to go into break dancing, a street dance that nobody mm. thinks would ever be anything. And then that goes like it's destined. And she was like, you're right. Da, da, da. Like, and, you know, by this time, I'm already B-boy gravity. So like like as a USA representative, it's a no brainer, you know. Um, and so it was something I was always excited for. And now crazy thing is whether or not uh, I felt like the Olympics would uh, respect breaking, I still knew that it was my job and I still know that it is my job to represent my culture and my artistry on a world platform like that, the largest world platform. So either way, whether um, you know they wanted to take advantage of breaking or not, this was uh, – an opportunity that you cannot pass up because at the end of the day, uh, if breaking is considered a sport, every breaker in the world sh is going to go to the Olympics and it's going to be a jam. Like that's going to be a jam. It's not going to be a competition. It's going to be a jam. And the Olympics is probably not going to be able to control it. You know, there's going to be parties everywhere. There's going to be small jams the day before and, you know, all these big events, they're going to piggyback this weekend. They're going to piggyback well, that week. They're going to piggyback it. And every breaker from all over the world is going to be there. And it's going to be massive. It's going to be massive. It's going to be the craziest thing on the planet. And we need to show up honest and true to our artistry. But in order for us to get there, we have to prepare like athletes. Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you firsthand – uh, this journey has been harder than any type of year that I've ever had in breaking mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you've helped me through it. Yeah. You know? So uh, it's even still like something that I, I don't look forward to is the process. I do not look forward to the process. I don't look forward to the next seven, 18, seven, 17, to 18 months. I do not look forward to the stress. Like I'm already getting like, emails and schedules and meetings that I have to attend because if I don't attend it, I'm going to miss out on information and uh, information that most of the time, like, yo, I don't want to hear. I don't, I don't, I kind of don't want to hear the politics. I don't want to hear um, anything, but what day I have to show up. I don't want to hear like what, I, I just want to hear when the event is, what day, like how long I need to be there, what country it's going to be in and how many points I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. I need to know who's in front of me, who's behind me, and if they win, where that places them. I just need to know. I just need to know the strategy. 
I don't want to know about anything else. I don't want to know mm-hmm. about what the, how the WDSF feels or what they're changing or what they're doing. I don't care. They've taken points away from me already. They've told me that this event was so important and then that got snatched away and then they're putting people in and, you know, they are just politically screwing us. I don't want to know about it anymore. I just want to train and recover and come up with some new stuff, show up, win, go home. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to show up and just like I'm hearing like, oh, you just got to do better than uh, everybody else in the United States. Like, no, that has never been my never been my mentality. Like, no, I need to go win. Like, that's the goal mm-hmm. here is to win. Like, That's I don't want to show up and like potentially the first time knowing what it feels like to win on a world platform is at the Olympics. That's not going to happen. I just you need to you need to know right, what that right. W feels like before, you know, so. You know, so, uh, you know, finding out about it a few years ago was dope. Knowing, like, knowing that it's actually happening is incredible. It's pretty cool um, because a lot of the big companies that thought they were the big dogs and the big fish in the pond or in the lake or in the ocean are no longer as big and they lose a lot of control, which frees up the dancers to do more. Um, And then, uh, you know, now, like, you know, People will take me serious. And I tell people that, oh, what do you, so what do you do for a living? It's like, uh, oh, I'm a professional uh, athlete. What sport? MMA? You got Monster, MMA, UFC? Like, uh, no, uh, breakdancing. Breakdancing? Like, I am so Mm. tired of that response because, yes, bro, breakdancing, you know, and it's nobody's fault, but, you know, breakers don't get taken serious, man, on any level, you know, on any level. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that is is important to share here is that some of the weight that you're carrying in the process of going to the Olympics is helping breaking transcend into new levels of recognition and not only doing that, but having to manage your energy, uh, not only to train as an athlete, but the politics, which is actually the reason I I tripled down on like really working with you and everybody who was on this path because I could just tell that although there's a lot of positive intention, people are putting in a lot of positive work and doing doing the things that need to be done, there's so much processing happening and so many changes happening and there's a lot of politics and they, they have done things that are, are clearly so that they can cast a bigger net, but it does become unfair in, in the process. Uh, that that to protect every athlete that is choosing to do this from that mess and to do exactly what you're saying, just to focus on the things that are in your control and to do that and nothing else. And then on top of that, it's the representation. It's not only representing your country yourself, but also representing breaking as a whole and, and carrying that weight on your shoulders is a big one. In addition to that, uh, paving the way for people that are coming in the the coming generations uh so that they can actually say i'm a breaker i'm a break dancer and for that to be taken seriously to be something that is uh respected it's kind of like uh somebody who's a media and says that they're a youtuber right yeah now a youtuber is a thing but uh it, it wasn't that just a few years ago and i think the same thing goes with breaking is is to be able to say i'm a professional break dancer, I'm a professional breaker, and for it to be recognized as something that uh, everybody knows. And carrying that weight is is a lot. And I think it needs to be discussed and talked about. And you should be able to vent these things so that you can yeah, continue to focus on things that are in your control. It's a lot. It's It's been more pressure um than ever you know um and i feel like for me more than anybody else uh not to really put myself anywhere but i'm the only person on team usa with kids five Uh, kids (laughs) five five kids yes and i am the only person uh on team usa that like like I'm, i'm besides morris like i'm the oldest you know, for the guys. And, you know, Morris is cool. He's like, hey, man, if I don't win, I just want to show up. You know, like, I just want to get there. I don't, that's not my mentality. This is, 
the only shot I ever have at being in the 2024 Olympics, just being in the Olympics in general, is the only shot I have. And I'll never be able to do it again because yeah, I'm just going to be too old. And not because my body is like not going to be able to handle it, although that will be a factor. I'm just ready for the next thing in my life, man. I've been breaking almost 18, oh, 17 years now. Like, that's a lot, man. 16, 17 years and doing it nonstop for so long. It's, it's truly a lot, man. It's probably too much. And so I don't want to, I want to be able to do this now. And so the pressure of, excuse me, uh, the pressure of, making the team was intense you know got to go to regionals then i lost the regional then i won two regionals um just to secure a slot and then i make nationals and then i go to nationals and then i win nationals and then but mind you i'm told like if you don't win or make it to the finals at nationals you are out you are not on the team to then make nationals win nationals and then to find out that they open up slots for other people to then find out, like, if you only, you have to, in order for you to even compete in the world level, you have to go to nationals and do this whole, like, journey to then find out that that's not the case, that other people can just be put into this. It's been a pretty emotional, mental warfare with myself to say, like, how do I know I'm not just going to get screwed at the end because there is no true pathway that is the way? You know, anything can be changed. A rule, a law can be changed at any given time. And it's like a group of people amongst themselves would be like, you guys think this is a good idea? Yeah, sure. Sign off on it. All right. Without talking to any of the athletes, we have zero say. I've never been in a situation where I don't have control. And mm. it's scary and it's un it's it's unnecessary and it sucks. Uh, so why so are you doing it? I'm doing it because I, no matter what, no matter if I bitch about it or complain about it, um, that's literally been my whole life. <laughs> my whole mm -hmm. life, nobody has ever handed anything to me. Uh, my whole life, nobody is like. Even when I tell my boys, they're like, they're like, dude, you're surprised. Like, like it's never. You've never had it easy. Like nobody's ever given anything to you. You know, except my mama. You know, and. Like, no, but it's never been an easy thing. Like, I've always had to figure it out on my own and I've always had to get it. Uh, it's never, I never fit in with one of those political cliques, you know, like I, I'm not, I'm not in a circle. I'm not in a circle where, you know, in that circle, there's like these guys and these guys judge. So like, you know, it's a, it's a real thing, like people voting for their friends and giving them the benefit of the doubt over your style, because that's who they roll with. And that's a, it's a real thing in our community. And so I've never rolled with a click. I don't have a click. Um, if you vote for me, it's because you actually like my shit and you like what I did. Um, mm -hmm. And so I go against people who actually just been living off of their circle and mm -hmm. making, making their way through just because of who they roll with and who supported them through this journey. And uh, it's massively unfair and it's frustrating. But at the end of the day, it's never stopped me from, from this. Like literally, it's never stopped me from this wall is it goes on, you know, and so it goes up and it goes down, you know, and so it's never stopped me. And so I don't think that this is going to stop me either. Um, I know that I'm going to be there. I know that I'm going to do it. I am afraid uh, that it anything is temporary. Like it's all temporary. It's not that serious. I am afraid of knowing a lot of information that I've learned and some realities and some true facts, but I'm also involved in something that is deemed impossible. Um, mm. The moves we do is impossible. Um, breaking not being on cardboard was impossible. You know, breaking going to the Olympics, impossible. Breakers being sponsored by Monster Energy, impossible. You know, I've been a part of too many uh, phenomenons to not think that something like going to the Olympics and winning is possible for me. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I do it also too, because very few people have immortality. Very few people have immortality. I want to be 
immortal, Carl. I want to be Julius Caesar immortal. You know? That, Have that, your name go down in history. For life. For, for as long as the human mind can go. And I don't know exactly how, but I know this will be one of the things. Well, you know? with, uh, with the technology, the way that it's going, uh, yeah, you'll be able to download your consciousness. And who knows if you can download your movements and, and those can be, you know, uh, plugged into somebody. Cryo. But I, I think, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think what I hear too is that you want to make a mark that creates an inflection point in breaking yes. and that does it in a way that you were pivotable, uh, pivotal uh, or instrumental in, in that moment in time and that uh, gravity is recognized as, as such a force that... Uh, An unstoppable yeah. force. Yeah, bent, bent space-time basically and uh, had, had some things happen because of, because of you. I, I hear that 100%. And I, I think if, if anybody is capable, you are. And, and uh, I can't wait to see uh, history uh, start it. to express itself in this process. I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I love you and I, I appreciate you. And I'm also a big fan, fan and I want to just Thank see you, you succeed. Uh, to, to bring this to kind of like a, a, a gentle close, what's the message for people? Uh, breaking, non-breakers, like what's... Uh, What's that legacy advice or legacy words that you, you leave people with? What do you want people to know? Well, you know, like, you know, I, I used to say, like, you know, change the game. Uh, I used to say today's the day. I still do. I still live by a lot of these things. I even say, like, the new athletes are artists. Um, but something that's been, like, in my heart, that I've realized like where my drive comes from is, um, is stop waiting because no one's coming, you know, no one's coming to help you stop waiting. You know, you gotta, you gotta get it. You gotta go, you gotta get up, you gotta get it. And, you know, I've been let down a lot. We got a lot of people that tell me, yeah, we can, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to help you do this and get there. And then, and at the end of the day, it's still me in here by myself um, more than when I'm with others, you know? Uh, and, and that has changed a lot for me. It's allowed me to move at a pace that is hard to keep up with. You know, when I realize, man, nobody's coming. So I'm going to do this. Like if practice is at six, I'm there at six or I'm there at 530. And I don't wait to see if anybody's coming. I'm already mid through my warm up by the time everybody starts showing up. You know, um, if if I say, yo, you guys want practice today and nobody comes to practice, I'm still going to practice. I didn't ask you to see if you guys wanted if if you guys wanted to practice. I'm basically asking you because I'm going to practice, you know, um, nobody's going to like lend me money. I know what I would do with a hundred thousand. I know I can make a hundred thousand millions, but nobody's going to lend it to me. So I got to make a hundred thousand, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm in the, in, in the world of impossibility, you know, and, uh, so are you. Mm-hmm. It is, it is damn near impossible to become self-made millionaire, billionaire, but people are doing it, you know, but it's, it's not a thought process, you know, in your average household. Um, you know, last night I asked my wife, I said, Hey, late, like she's ready to fall asleep. I actually woke up like, Hey, question. She's like, what? I said, you think I could be a millionaire? And then she said, yeah. And I said, you think I could be a billionaire? That's a very different bracket. <laughs> um, and she said, yes. And I was like, why? And she said, because you're persistent. Mm. And believing that you can do it is a very hard thing. Like to honestly believe, like, do you honestly believe, you know, that you can do it? You have to, uh, because remember I told you in the very beginning of this conversation, I said, nobody knows the real you. 
Only you know those conversations. So if somebody says, yo, you think you'll be a billionaire? I'm like, yeah, I could be a billionaire. Let's really dig deep here. Do you really? Like, now let's ask yourself when nobody's there. And the truth is, uh, the only thing I'm afraid of is time. I feel like it's the only thing that would stop me from being a billionaire is because what I've chosen um, is time. And so, you know, if I'm being honest, do I think I could become a millionaire? Yes. But to be a billionaire, I think I'm, I think I need more time, you know, and I'm not talking about lot years. I'm like lifespan time. I'm talking about more time. You know, my, my time is spread thin, you know, I have a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. I got business, this, that. So, you know, I want to be, uh, not just memorable to the world, but to my family more than anything. I want, you know, I don't get these, you don't get these times back with your grandson. So you mm -hmm. live in that moment. He, this is just a timestamp. He's going to be a grown man one day. These are, this is going to be gone, you know, and I, and I have that with five kids. And so, you know, can I be a billionaire? Probably not, man, because I rather, I rather be with my kids, you know, um, but I can be a millionaire and I think that'll be enough. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just say like, you know, stop waiting. You know, because nobody's coming. You got to get it. And you got to be present. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with the go get it. And I think one of the things that is interesting, just listening to you when you're talking about millionaire, billionaire, these are just kind of markers that allow you to express yourself and are a byproduct of the way that you express yourself that produces a lifestyle for yourself and for those who you care about. And allows you to continue to, like you were saying earlier, uh, break forever, uh, regardless of it being physical breaking in competition or simply uh, a different expression of that, whether it's through teaching or yeah. uh, mentorship or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I love it. And you, you definitely are relentless. That's something that you are. And uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, you know that if you uh, uh, type in uh, relentless.com, Amazon pops up. That was Jeff Bezos thing. I didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah. Relentless.com. I learned this from a friend, Logan Gelbrick. He, he, he brought it up. Yeah. So relentless you are, and you're very persistent. And I think your capacity to learn and pivot uh, is going to uh, assist you in that process. And I think the, the Olympics is going to be lucky to have you uh, when you're there. And um, I, I do believe you're going to make, uh, not only your family and your country proud, but uh, also the breaking community as a whole. So, yeah, yeah keep keep at it. Do your thing. I, oh, I appreciate yeah. you uh, very much and, and for, for sharing with me today and taking the time. I learned a lot. Thank you. That's dope. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. How can people support you? Uh, where do people follow you? And uh, what can they do to uh, be part of the wave that, that carries you uh, and helps carry you to uh, the Olympics? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I have catchrec.com. So C-A-T-C-H-W-R-E-K.com. And that's my website. On the website is uh, where, you know, you, there's an area where you can learn more about me. Uh, and then there's an area where you can buy gear. And there's an area where you can uh, kind of learn about what the brand represents. And then on Instagram, it's gravity uh, underscore 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 official. I really wanted to get uh, gravity, just a word, but somebody owns it. And it's been like, like unactive for years. Uh, I think if you look up gravity official, it, it does pop up right yeah. away. If you look up B-Boy Gravity, you yeah. pop up right away. So yeah. yeah, people will find you. Yeah. And then um, as far as support goes, man, um, you know, uh, just really just catch rec.com purchase gear there's a donation area too where you can donate uh, and all the proceeds go to my projects that i do here that only further uh my capabilities um to succeeding uh not just for myself but for my students and my community um a lot of the a lot of the money i gain i put back into my community and i just uh invest into my facility where i train to uh potentially accomplish the impossible amazing Dude, well, thank you. I appreciate you. And uh, yeah, well, we're going to have to do a follow up when uh, you got that medal around it's, your neck. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> All right, dude. All right, Carl. Appreciate it. Thanks, Peace. man. This is the freestyle way.